everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Mark Kaplan. I'm the manager of the Bazazian branch of the Chicago Public Library, which is in the Uptown neighborhood, if you aren't familiar with Chicago. White man with a short beard and glasses and salt and pepper hair. You've joined us tonight for Gollum Girl, Reva Lair in conversation with Lawrence Weschler. Please note that you're attending through Zoom webinar. Your best view is gallery view. Uh, you can click the view button in the upper right corner uh, of the screen and choose that view if you're not seeing it now. You can also see a live transcript by clicking on the CC at the bottom of the screen and then click on show subtitles. If you haven't used Zoom webinar before, you'll see that you have no access to audio or video, but we welcome chat comments. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A link at the center bottom of the screen. We'll try to get to all the questions at the end of the program. I'd like to acknowledge the effort of my colleagues throughout Chicago Public Library who are putting together a slew of excellent virtual programs for all ages, book discussions, craft programs, author talks, um, all of which can be found on the CPL website and on our YouTube page. I'd also like to give a shout out to Mariella Cologne our tech maven, without whom tonight's program would have just been a phone call. Thanks, Mariella. I also want to thank the sign language interpreter and the live captioner for assisting with tonight's program, and Desiree Kettler for coordinating these accessibility features. I'm very excited tonight to welcome Riva and Lawrence. Riva Lehrer is an outstanding and nationally renowned artist who reimagines socially challenged bodies and was recently selected for the inaugural class of the Mellon and Ford Foundation's Disabilities Futures Fellows. Riva has exhibited all over the country and beyond and has a portrait of graphic novelist Alison Bechtel in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. She teaches medical humanities at Northwestern University and is a longtime instructor at the Art Institute of Chicago. And if that makes you feel like you're slacking off, there's more. Reva just published her critically acclaimed memoir, Gollum Girl. I've had the great fortune to get to know Reva over the last few years as a patron of the Bazazian branch and as a friend, but it wasn't until I read Gollum Girl that I really understood what Reva's life has been like. Short of providing you with a synopsis of the book, I will just implore you to read it. It sounds like a cliche, but it's true. You will laugh out loud, you will cry out loud, and you will marvel at her strength and determination. Gollum Girl is strikingly candid. Lawrence Weschler, former artistic director of the Chicago Humanities Festival, is a, a writer of diverse interests, having written on politics, history, art, literary criticism, and more. His most recent book is, And How Are You, Dr. Sachs? A biographical memoir of Oliver Sachs. Wren is a former New Yorker writer, a two-time winner of the George Polk Award for Journalism, and a winner of the Lannan Literary Award. Check out his website, lawrenceweschler.com, for hours of interesting reading and to learn more about the breadth of his work. All right, enough from me. Lawrence, or Ren, Reva, go ahead and take it over. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Ren is a balding 68-year-old with a salt and pepper beard and a nice blue shirt and a nice brown jacket. Reva, what are you? <laughs> That's a really good question. I am a <laughs> short, disabled white woman with uh, silver and red streak hair who is currently wearing um, her very, very treasured Bride of Frankenstein sweater. And it is a pretty sweater. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, why don't we start up, Riva? Um, sometimes when I'm talking about you, you and I have known each other for well over a decade now. Uh, but uh, when people ask me about you, one of the first things I say is that you, uh, and I don't mean to, don't take this wrong, but that you have no business being alive. That uh, you were born, can we say the year? Yeah, 1958. Yeah, 1958. With spina bifida, and at a time when people born with spina bifida were supposed to last about two or three years, um, and they certainly weren't supposed to last more than fifty. And here you are, uh, 
not only alive, but extraordinarily, exquisitely lively. Um, maybe we could start out by going back to 58 and describing very quickly, you begin there in the book and, and you kind of do it from your mother's point of view, what, what, what that was like. So maybe start with that. Well, um, at the time, uh, the surgery to close the lesion known as spina bifida, which is what happens when the tube around what will be the spinal column and the cord in the fetus doesn't completely close. So it, it's sort of wraps around like this. And in some cases, the tube doesn't close and you can get bony gaps, you can get gaps in the soft tissue. In my case, it was all of the above and uh, part of my cord was extruded outside my body. Let's start and before that. Your, your mother goes into labor a month early, right? Right. Well, what I didn't know, um, I only found this out mm, in the middle of writing the book, which is where the book just went in a totally <laughs> different direction, which was that my mother worked for a guy named Josef Workeny. And Josef Workeny was uh, an Austrian physician who had gotten, as a young, brilliant man, gotten a um, fellowship to study at Cincinnati Children's Hospital to come over and do work in early genetics. And when he was over, this little thing called, you know, World War II started off. And obviously, as a Jew from Austria, he couldn't go back. So he set up a life in Cincinnati. And what he did was that he's called the father of teratology. And what teratology is literally means the study of monsters. Tetros in Greek uh, means monster. And the point is that before the study of teratology, the things that got ascribed to causing birth defects, um, sometimes I prefer saying birth variances, um, would be everything from like the mother had a traumatic experience. The mother looked at something frightening. The mother had the wrong kind of emotional makeup to be a mother. The all kinds of stuff usually coming down to blaming the mother for something. And he was one of the early people to start looking for scientific and rational reasons. For and, and your mother was working in his office? So I thought she was his secretary for a long time. And then halfway through uh, researching the book, I said that to my uncle and my uncle went, she wasn't a secretary. And I'm like, what was he? She was a medical researcher. And I went, what? <laughs> so what that meant is that when I was born with this uh, condition, that they had just like, from what I could figure out, like within two years before I was born, came up with a surgery to close the gap because most of the time a kid would be born and they couldn't do anything about it. And they'd tell the parent, enjoy the baby for as long as it lives and that's it. And they'd come up with it there in Cincinnati among other places. And, and, but, but the point, is, so you're born, first of all, it took a little while even to figure out that you were a girl. You were all in swamp yeah, was, and all kinds of stuff. stuff. And, was, and then what is she? She's, and then, and then, the word your mother hears the phrase spina bifida and she says wait a second that's what i i know about that that's i mean that's the thing almost all parents at the time put their kids in institutions if they had the kind by the way thereby yeah. proving that that mothers who spend their time thinking about spina bifida <laughs> there you go he proved he, he, you're the exception that proves the rule but anyway <laughs> you can i'll stop look at i'll it. stop i'll stop <laughs> This is what anyway. our relationship is like, audience. This is it. Okay. Right now, coming here. Back, we're, but coming we're back. Off, we're off to the race. Coming back. So this is absolutely astonishing. So you were now at this point saying that, that there was an operation that could be done for starters. And, and yeah, right, right. I mean, just to finish my point is that because mom was familiar, not just with spina bifida, but with the, all kinds of teratological mm -hmm. conditions, she was not phased the way that a lot of other parents would have been like, oh, I can't deal, or, you know, mom was in there fighting right away. So 
Uh, it's also the case that uh, with the operation, ordinarily they would have waited two or three years because what's the use? The patient's going to die anyway. Before and, they invented this. And so she was really lobbying already for you on that basis too. And they happened to have a surgeon. They just had hired this guy from uh, Mass General um, who was trained in this brand new technique. And, and my hospital was across the street from his hospital. So there's like, you know, carrying the baby in the basket across the street here. Uh, so I didn't come home for two years. Um, and during that period, she was still under pressure to institutionalize me because they told her I was going to be a vegetable. And I always picture cauliflower, don't know why. Um, and she was just like, I think that she'd already seen so many kids with so many impairments that she believed that we could carve a different path. So By the way, I just it took a long time. I just want to begin, by the way, by showing th this book, by the way, Golem Girl, is an absolutely incredible book, as I told you this. But, so there's the book. But the point is that it is, it, it's just gorgeously written. And you have no business being able to write like this on your first book. But having said that, there's some pretty great pictures. And here is one of my favorites. There's mom and me. It's me when I had my looks. <laughs> and... So she you tell the story that, that the doctors were giving her a great deal of pressure. Um, and by the time you were two, she had spent weeks and weeks rehearsing you. Tell, tell them about that. Uh, this is my favorite story that mom used to tell me, which was that, you know, she's being told that I'll never do this and I'll never do that. I'll never have any uh, cognitive abilities. And so she... When we were alone together, she would sit me on her lap and she'd get out uh, a list of, I guess, a list of the drugs that they were giving me and teach me to say them. And I was very verbal. I was already reading by the time I was two, but uh, we developed this ventriloquist act that, not literally, but it looked like that, that the doctor one day, the whole grand rounds comes in and she tells them that I have something to tell them. And I start to spout our, our script, which was to tell them things like, please give me Thorazine instead of Compazine because Compazine makes me, makes me throw up, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and I'm going on and on about what drugs I hate and what drugs I, I like. And, and they're all just, the Grand Rounds guys are like, so. The grads rounds guys who had been saying you have to institutionalize her. Yeah, that I was never going to, um, well, you know, I don't want to use the demeaning language that they used back then, but basically it's this bizarre thing of they were working very hard to save me. I had by that point dozens of surgeries. I'd been in the hospital for two years and yet their vision of what that was for was to put me in an institution, which is so strange to me like where was their imagination of this fabulous medical imagination of possibility but they had like no imagination about what to do with the life that they were saving and, so and the my person mom, who really saved you was your mother uh, yeah exactly. the one who really saved me was my mother so i want to say you know this but and the only reason i don't is because i've read you and you make it so clear that your mother is one of the more amazing people I mean, she, she comes through as this incredible, fierce proponent of possibility for you. And, and, and uh, well, here's, here's a little story of my mother's force of will that's not in the book. Okay. okay. So we lived on the dead end of a street in Cincinnati. And the dead end was lined by families that had kids, lots of kids, especially boys. And my brothers were always out playing ball and-, and Two stuff. younger brothers. And my younger brothers. I have one who's just shy of two years younger and one that's uh, seven years younger. Um, and so one day, I think somebody had like shoved my littlest brother, done something to him and he was crying, he was very upset. And my mother comes out on the porch and my mom was, sort of tall and a big woman and um, extremely charismatic. And she comes out and within five minutes, she's got the entire street of little kids 
sitting on the lawn while she lectures him about ethics and morals. And <laughs> they did not budge until she was done. And she's just sort of standing there in her house coat telling him about, you know, uh, being responsible for who you're going to be in the world. And I'm, I'm standing by the bushes and I'm watching the kids just be like riveted, partly fascinated and partly just terrified. So that, that'll give you an idea. The kids, by the way, give you a hard time? Not kids. on my street. On my street, they were used to me and I had really close friendships. But as soon as I left the immediate, plus I had a lot of cousins on the street and it was very, it was one of those neighborhoods where your, your relatives are all pretty close by. Um, but as soon as I got off my street, like if we went down to Swifton Center, which was the shopping mall near us, it was just um, being stared at and harassed the whole time. So it, I had my little enclaves of safety in various places, but I was very aware that if I stepped out of that enclave, I was going to be in for it. Why do you call yourself a golem girl? Well, there's multiple genesis. What's the plural of genesis? Genocide. Genocide. <laughs> Here, by the way, is one of my golems. Just one of them. Uh, whoa, 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 I, have a collection. I have a collection. Should you doubt? So, by the way, this is a Jewish neighborhood, a Jewish family, and tell some Jewish stories here. So, I'm going to give you a little background on what a golem is. Um, so, the first golem actually is Adam, which is called, the word golem in Hebrew means something like shapeless mass. So, Adam is described before he's finished being modeled out of clay, that he starts as a shapeless mass, and then he becomes this uh, being who is mystically um, brought to life by the breath of God. And this is the template for all golems, is that they're an inert body and then they are somehow enlivened through supernatural means of some kind. And, and they're constructed. And they're constructed. They yeah. are always constructed. Um, but that the golems that follow Adam uh, don't become human beings. There are always monsters, robots, androids, um, dolls that talk, puppets. This magically enlivened, constructed bodies go all the way through almost every culture. And Mary Shelley is riffing on this when she... You know, Mary Shelley apparently knew the story of the golem. Yeah. So, but the classic story of the golem uh, is from, I believe, 16th century Prague. And the idea is that there's the chief rabbi of Prague, who's uh, Judah von Betzalel, and Loe, Jew, Judah Lo von, von Betzalel. And he hears there's going to be a pogrom against the Jews. And a pogrom, for those of you who don't know, is like when the Gentiles of a village or a city would come into the Jewish area and destroy the businesses, attack and sometimes kill the Jews, sometimes rape the women. I mean, just catastrophic for centuries. So here's a, there's going to be a particularly terrible one against the Jews of Prague. And so he prays about what to do, and he has a vision to go down to the river and to build this, this creature. So he builds a creature out of mud, and he has a little scroll with uh, one of the mystical names of secret names of God, and he puts it in the golem's mouth, and then he writes the word uh, emmet on the forehead, um, which means truth. And, and the golem rises up and goes into Prague at night and listens at windows and finds out who the conspirators are and captures them and takes them and locks them up in jail in the night. And the jailers come in every morning and there's more guys there. And the guys are like, you know, there's a monster. So eventually uh, the magistrates of Prague say, okay, okay, we're gonna make sure there's not gonna be a, a pogrom. But meanwhile, every time the golem comes back, and there's a reason for me to tell you all the details. Every time the golem comes back, it's bigger. It's bigger and bigger and bigger and getting out of control. And the point there is that it's in the world. It's becoming its own creature. It's learning, it's learning about the world. It's learning about itself. So it's getting less controllable. 
So the rabbi decides that it's not abuse anymore because there's not going to be any more pogrom. And he has, he goes, come here, come here, come here. And the golem bends over and he wipes off uh, the first letter of emet, which is an aleph. And the word that's left is met, which means dead or death. And the golem crumples into mud. Now, the thing is, the reason I chose this is that or the reason it's haunted me for a long time, and then I chose it, is that first off, I feel like a constructed being. I have scars everywhere, and I always think of them as signatures of my surgeons and my doctors. But I also, like I said, my doctors saved me without purpose. And in all stories of golems, the golem is only allowed to exist if it serves the purpose of its creator. It's never allowed to have a purpose of its own or it becomes threatening. And so there's a lot in this story about the strangeness of being a disabled person at the time that I grew up where there were certain progressive things happening like the school I went to, but there was nothing in the world itself, nothing that invited us to be there. We weren't supposed to go to college. We weren't supposed to have jobs or families careers or anything. So I think of myself as this monster that was like constructed and then given no way into the world. Um, so well, there stop are for a second there. Yeah. The, other, the other thing that I think of is that you're a superhero. I would No, no, that. no, I'm serious that, that the Golub is a force for liberation and so forth, and for defense and so forth, and, and uh, as part of the story. And that's, you don't ever claim that, but that's one of the things I would do. But coming back to that point, um, when, when you're five years old, um, you go to school. Now in those days, uh, I guess most people in your situation didn't go to school at all. They were already at the institution or whatever, but, but to the extent of nowadays, there's a whole thing about mainstreaming people and so forth. But then what was it, what was involved there? What did it mean to go to school? Where'd you go to school? Well, I went to this really fascinating place called Condon School that had been built uh, in the early 1900s. Um, it's something I'm thinking about a lot right now because I think it was started by the mothers of a lot of disabled children who I did quite a bit of a historical research and you'll see these articles in the Cincinnati paper where these women were like giving bake sales and you know tea dances and stuff and encouraging people to send in their nickels and they built what at the time was the most accessible school just about that had ever been built now we would look at it and go really but back then it was mind-blowingly innovative so, so you were you arrived there and there's all sorts of kids with all sorts of disabilities. Are you at first shocked by this or are you delighted or what is your response? Well, I was used to seeing kids with disabilities in the hospital. For a while, I wasn't sure if I was in another hospital, but I, I figured it's right out. Near the hospital, this place, right? Say that again? The place is right near the hospital, right? Yeah, it's right near the hospital. And I right. actually, you know, would over the years, some of my classmates would be my hospital roommates when I went back in. And there was quite a bit of permeability between Children's Hospital and Condon. But the innovative thing was that they were giving kids like me as close to a standard academic education as they could figure out how to do. And this was not the done thing. If you went to school at all, you went to a vocational school that taught you how to do things like pack boxes, work in a sweatshop, sheltered wet work sweatshop, and um, you barely got any kind of literacy or numeracy, just enough to like, you know, very, very basic tasks. And uh, so they, they taught us a regular uh, mainstream educational program with variances. Um, but then again, by the time uh, school ended in eighth grade, it was kindergarten through eighth, uh, legally none of the high schools anywhere in the country were under any obligation to take us in. So a lot of kids, eighth grade was as 
far as they were going to get to go. Um, it really was continually this sort of just cliff of, well, we've gotten you here and now we can't figure out how to get you any farther. Before we go on, because I want to figure out what happens after that, but but um, obviously nowadays the the rule is or the 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 practice is to mainstream kids. What do you think? How would you compare? Is that a good thing? Uh, was it better for you? Do you think or? It's good and it's bad. Um, mainstreaming opens up possibilities for everybody. Uh, academically. I have questions about it socially because what I got from Condon was that, and it's totally the basis of the work I do now as a portrait artist, is that I was, I grew up for nine years with a range of bodies that were just about everything you can imagine and behaviors and cognitive situations. And I understood that I was part of a continuum and that I was part of I didn't have words for it yet, but that I was part of a way of being. Um, so the school was like 220 kids, something like that. And we all had disabilities. And so if you were in Girl Scouts, all the Girl Scouts were disabled. If you were in the school play, everybody in the play was disabled. And now my impression is that you have two or three kids in a class and a lot of times they avoid each other because of this thing called cumulative stigma. Whereas if you're trying to be normal, the whole point is be as normal as you can, fit in, fit in. Everybody's the same. And so you don't wanna hang out with the other kid who's different because you get more marked. And you have no sense of yourself as part of a group or a culture or a society. And then what I also hear is that when you hit puberty, that even if you, and I could be wrong, but these are the stories I hear that even if you've been accepted up till then, as soon as dating starts, you get you get sidelined. That all of a sudden you thought you were accepted and now you're not. And I feel like if we're going to have mainstreaming, there has to be a way of connecting kids to their identity in a positive way. I mean, culture and politics and accomplishments and everything like schools have curriculum for all kinds of identity histories and almost nothing for disability. And I think it's crucial. By the way, I'm just flashing sideways here laterally to this uh, film that came out this year, uh, Crip Camp, uh, which it occurs to me that there, uh, talk about that a little bit, but, but the idea was that this was a summer camp uh, for kids, many of who were it was the only time they were all able to get together as a group. Um, and My friend Jim Lebrecht uh, actually got footage from this, this um, uh, summer camp that was like partly just kind of a do-it-yourself kind of place. So these people started it and it wasn't part of like, you know, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or Habunim or anything. It was just sort of this place that these this couple I think founded and where was it oh god it I was in New York somewhere I think in the Catskills I think or? yeah I think yeah I don't quote me I don't remember that part but I think so um but kids came from all over uh and everything was the way he describes it everything was okay like you weren't you got help with whatever you needed help with, but otherwise you were a kid. You were just doing all summer camp stuff and and it was a lot of teenagers. So there's teenager stuff going on. And you know, when you were a teenage crip kid, especially back then, your sexuality was a huge threat. You know, it's still not so great, but it's sort of better now. Um, but back then people didn't want to think of you as having desire or ever maybe being in a family or having children or, you know, you were sort of just, a, again, a dead end. And these kids are just getting high and flirting and messing around and being kind of bad. And, you know, I understood it so well, like the incredible joy of critical mass 
of being with other disabled people where you let down your shields because the first time I ever went to Berkeley, which is where a lot of these people ended up for complicated reasons, Berkeley is a major center of disability culture anywhere. And what I saw, this really hit me. I was walking down the street near the university and I'm passing all these disabled people. And none of them had the look on their face that I was used to seeing here, which is that you would pass somebody with an invisible disability and they'd be bracing themselves, like not looking at you or being afraid that, you know, somebody is gonna be a jackass or, or ask, do you need help? Or, you know, Ren, a third of the time that I go out for my run in the morning, I still have people coming up to me and saying, you're so brave to be out here doing what you do. And I'm like, I have my headphones on, I'm listening to NPR, <laughs> go away. <laughs> But they didn't have that bracing themselves look that we have here because Berkeley is this place where you can, at least at the time, let down your shields. There's a critical mass, people get you, it's accessible. And that's what I saw in the faces of the people in Crip Camp. They could like stop protecting themselves for five whole minutes. I want to go back for a second to you in the eighth grade, but, but before, what is the appropriate way Especially if, if there's kids who come upon, you know, who are with, see you walking down the street or running and so forth, it, it, what what would you prefer? And short of that, what would you prefer? <laughs> it depends. When I encounter kids who are just curious, just purely curious, I'll answer anything. But what they learn really fast is that when you see somebody who's different, you don't go like this. You go like this. You know, it's, they learn from their parents right away to look judgmental and dismayed in some way. And so you get little kids who are doing the parental face. And it's hard for me to even be nice to those four-year-olds because I'm so sick of that expression. I know it's not their fault, but it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to be as kind as I should be. Adults, God, there's not much I want to hear from a strange adult. No. I, I'll take it back. Um, I used to get a lot of insults about my orthopedic shoes. Now I get, wow, are those cool? And that I love. So it <laughs> into like my, my boots, whom you cannot see, one is larger than the other. One, the big one is George, and the other one is Gracie, named after George Burns and Gracie Allen. <laughs> and, uh, and they have, I swear to God, an international fan club. But um, other than that, it's like, why do you need to talk to me? Do you, like, do you really need to pull up next to me while I'm on my way somewhere and ask me? and I'm not making this up, do I need a ride to the hospital? Like, I'm grocery shopping. I don't need, <laughs> it just doesn't stop. So no, I don't wanna hear much, that, okay. but that's just me. Let me take you back to the eighth grade. We're not gonna talk, we're gonna go a little bit faster just because I wanna get you up okay. closer to the present. Two things to be said. You are, incredibly mm -hmm. articulate and incredibly self-confident and and uh and i mean you you're you're you you are you are but you, but to what extent are you that way already at the eighth grade are you are you who you are today? <laughs> no no <laughs> this comes later i mean inside condon you know i ran with the cool kids <laughs> <laughs> Outside of Condon, no, I belong to Habunim, and I was so terrified that when I, it's a, a Jewish group, Jewish youth group, I was so scared of the world that I would, for the first two years that I belonged, I sat under the meeting table. I wouldn't sit in a chair. I was so scared of everybody. I sat under the table, which of course, <laughs> I didn't think I was totally normal. <laughs> um, and then I, I went to an all-girl high school um, 
where I was the only disabled kid, one of the few Jews, one of the few scholarship students. Um, you, yes, I was, boy, those were good times. <laughs> so no, I was not like this. So where, and then you went from there to, well, I, I should just mention one thing about your mother, that your mother, talk about. Don't, I mean, she, don't this, talk about what happened to mom, that, that needs to be in the book, okay? Okay, we'll leave that. Anyway, but, but so in any case, you go, and then you go to art school? Yes, and uh, just parenthetically, my mom had a really, really hard life. I don't want to go into some of the details right now, but part of the story of my mother and I is that she did become disabled when I was four. So our relationship was a lot about the very, our very different and yet completely entwined experiences of uh, having a severe spinal disability. Hers was acquired, mine was natal, but yeah. that was the story of our relationship. Yeah. So um, it, yeah. Uh, and then there's art school. What about art do you, school? Do you, well, do you begin, so how is it that you're an artist at this point? How do you know you want to go to art school? You could do anything. No. Um, well, first off, my time at Condon had left me with a lot of academic deficit. Um, I have severe, uh, uh, what do you call it? Dyscalculus. And there wasn't a class or a program at Seven Hills to bring me up to speed. Um, I was at least three years behind on math when I hit high school. That was awful. And uh, there were just other academic deficits because Condon was so far behind. They did their best, but it was not, I wasn't at the same level as other kids when I came out. Um, but also there were things that I wanted to do like med school that at the time being a kid, being a, a, someone with my kind of impairment, they just laugh at you. So they're, they're med school, veterinary school, both things I was very interested in were clearly closed to me. Um, when I came out of high school, my English teacher and my art teacher actually almost came to blows fighting over which thing I should study. And that's, I don't need to go into that, but I ended up going to art school because the art room had always, really it came down to the art room had been my retreat, um, both in elementary school and in high school. It was the place I felt safe. And so I think I just needed a, some traumatic stuff that happened and I really needed a safe place. So I think that's why I chose art school. Okay. Which begins to get us a thing for those of you who don't know, I mean, Revo, as has been described, will, will grow into an extraordinary artist, uh, portraitist. Um, what's striking to me is there are these two themes about visuality, about the gaze, G-A-Z-E. Part of your book is about you want to be seen you want to be seen, not gawked at, you know? And part of the book is about the gawking gaze of others and so forth. But it's striking to me that, that all of these are things about how you look in the world and how you look out at the world, which seems to me obviously would, would lead for some very exciting fertile ground if you're going to be a visual artist who's... who's uh, well, I, I think that's completely true that um, uh, as should be obvious, I you know, was always extremely acutely aware of being looked at, but also of the pleasure of seeing other people like me when I was little. And then I lost that pleasure because once I started to grow up, the negativity and the viciousness about people who were different just made me withdraw and start to hate even seeing other disabled people and really hate seeing myself badly. And that's a hard thing to survive. I think there was a part of me deep underneath trying to find a way out of that that didn't know how. And, but I, 
fell in love with portraiture, not right away with disability portraiture or the portraiture of people who are different, but the long look at another person, the kind of thing that you got from Northern Renaissance painting, that very slow kind of bliss of detail of like the materiality of a person. Um, just enchanted me. I would guess that also the situation of being with somebody who you were permitted to spend a lot of time looking at and who could look at you and looking at you would see, would, would finally see you if they were being portrayed. So the relationship was going both ways. But that would have been very important for you. That's been transformative. Um, I mean, skipping over everything to who I am now, um, which is fine with me, uh, <laughs> please. Um, Take my life, please. I'm starting to feel a little like, Reva Lair, this is your life. Um, <laughs> no, this, <laughs> this is my life. Anyway, sorry. Uh, the, I, the portraiture I do is um, very concerned with the ethics of the studio. And the ethics have to do with what it means to be looked at, not whether I, somebody gets enough breaks or whether a model gets paid or that kind of thing. It has to do with what does it mean if I'm going to look at someone for a long time and what does it mean if they're looking back at me and who's holding the power? How do you ethically share that power or use it? But also, sitting there while somebody's looking at me while I'm looking at them um, is very vulnerable. I mean, I keep making the point that when you see a portrait in, in a museum, you just see this picture of a person and you have no idea almost ever what the relationship, unless there's wall text, which there rarely is, about what the relationship was between the sitter and the artist. Um, how the artist felt about being looked at. I mean, it's so complicated when you're sitting there with somebody for, I mean, I've done your portrait, you've had other people do your portrait. Mm -hmm. You know, how is it for you to like, I mean, you've got multiple portraits and you've seen yourself from various standpoints through different mm -hmm. people's eyes. See, what's interesting for me is that I see it more, and I think I think you do too. I think we did when you did my portrait, is it's a play of gazes, not just a deep ethical dilemma. Yeah, no, I don't mean- You, you, you have a hard time having a deep eth ethical dilemma with me. I keep on trying to tell you, even though you keep on telling me all the ethical faux pas I make <laughs> with you. <laughs> But, That's why you love me, I know. Oh, you know, there you go. But um, but that, that, that there is, that the, the, hmm. the play of regard, it's not only loaded and complex, it also ha gives way to a kind of a fierce joy it's, of being seen. That's the point. It's so, ah, uh, it's the best. It is the best. So, so now let me ask you something because we, uh, let me see. Oh God, we have, let, let me ask you one, one or two last questions because we want to open up to questions from people. Um, uh, the, the fast version of the question is what goddamn business do you have being such a good writer? But a different question is, no, I'm serious. You are, this is a really good book, folks. You should really read this book for the writing. But this is a self-portrait. Yes. So give it all the complication and all the weirdness of gazes and gazes and gazes and gazes, you know. How did this play out? You've done self-portraits of your, you've done some some remarkable, very frank and very complicated painterly self-portraits. How is it different to write a self-portrait? When I do somebody's portrait, because normally when you, to pick someone with a disability, a lot of times the idea is that you're showing a person whose life is composed of pain. And that even if you show them being happy, that because being disabled is seen as this horrible pain state, 
existentially, literally, that you can't show a disabled person without inferring that they're in pain. So when I work with other people, I almost always try to move away from that. My self portraits are the exception. Um, that is in the studio. That's where I explore what it means to deal with pain, all kinds of all kinds of pain. But when I did the book, I I kept fighting with my editors because they kept saying I would put down something that was I guess difficult, and they'd say, "But how did it feel?" And I'm like, "Well." isn't it obvious how that would feel? And they're like, no, tell us how you felt. And I got really angry and didn't want to explain it emotionally. I just wanted to say what had happened because I thought that that was enough. Because I thought that going on about how miserable I was or how hurt I was or how whatever um, flattened the entry point for the reader badly. I still feel that there's still parts of the book that I, I would gladly have taken out. But also because it was always more than that. It, pain is not, it's not a primary color. You know, it's like the color black, you know, every, every color all mixed together. And so it was hard working with an outside team of editors to figure out how to talk about pain without it um, either falling into that idea that, yes, being disabled is all about being in pain, which I didn't want to have happen, but also to try and find some kind of emotional honesty that didn't feel like I was being um, uh, coy about my experience. Yeah. So that, that's how I'd put it. Yeah. People should understand this is not by any means a book that's just about you and pain. I mean, there, there is oh. there is incredible There's a lot of joy meaning. and wonder and delight. You're, I mean, you know, far from anything, you're, you're, you're a delightful person and you're really funny in this book. Um, and you're really vivid. And I, one last thing I want to ask, and then we'll open it up. And all I can say is you people are great. By the way, you've had this whole thing for free Go out and buy the book. Also, buy it at an independent bookstore. Yes. Here in Chicago, Women and Children First is my spiritual home. Okay. Any indie book independent bookstore. bookstores at this of all times are the spine of democracy. It is the spinal cord of democracy. Uh, and, and you have to go buy this book at that store. Anyway, but having said that. Oh, and I'm going to have an essay in the New York Times this weekend. Oh, fantastic. So look for that. But you're also, part of what the book's about for me is just how vivid you are. And, and something, I, I will say this one thing we, we talked with whether I say it or not, but I will. To this day, I mean, the amount you live, it's not a question of pain. You live an existential life where you are, at any given moment, can be going to the hospital. And sometimes you disappear for weeks and then I call you up. I say, how have you been? Well, I've been in intensive care for three weeks. I say, you're supposed to call your friends when that happens. If I called my friends every time I was in intensive care, nobody would get anything done, you know. But the point is, but I, but I would argue that, that the vividness of life in you comes in part from, from that proximity. I mean, that you are being made aware of and, 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 you, and it comes out of the book. I, I just say that the book is a very lively piece of work as well. Let's let's ask let's have some questions. We only have a few minutes. And by the way, at a certain point, we're going to lose the interpreter and the captioner. But maybe we can keep talking beyond that. But for for starters, let's let's does that make sense to you, Reva? We'll, no, we'll, I'll we'll do it. whatever y'all want. Okay. So, Mark, right. tell us what to do. Yeah, I'm back. Um, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, let's see what we can get in real quickly. Uh, so, Yero asks, um, I'm wondering when Reva first started feeling this connection to the golem. And that kind of goes with a question someone else asked. Uh, Amy asked, can you uh, talk about growing up, how growing up Jewish influenced your attitude in art? So maybe you can throw all that together. <laughs> um, I don't remember when I started loving the golem. I do remember always identifying with monsters in movies for the most, 
longest time subconsciously. And then I finally figured out that, uh, that I loved monster movies because I felt like they were the closest thing to my life that I ever got to see. Um, ergo, the bride here. Um, Jewish, there's, I mean, there's more Jewish visual culture than people know. The idea that we don't have a visual culture is not right. But certainly the painting that I grew up, uh, I know a lot about Catholicism because <laughs> I've done a lot of studies in art history and in European painting. And you can't, you can't know much about European figuration without learning about the Catholic church. And- uh, Lots and of pain in those pictures. Lots of pain and that's a whole other that's a different lecture. Um, but we were, we were a visual family. Um, I guess my mom's side of the family has a lot of talent. But the thing that we could all share across the boards was words. So wordplay and words, I would say more than visuals. It shows up here in the book. Um, Ruth asks, uh, have you gone to Condon, uh, your your primary school reunions? Have you been to reunions? <laughs> I wish there were. They knocked down Condon years ago. Um, there's a quasi mainstream school now called Roseland Condon that is not a happy story for me. Um, at least half of my graduating class has already passed away. Um, I'm in some contact with a few of the kids that are, they're not kids anymore, obviously, but that are still around. In fact, uh, several of them helped me enormously with this book, particularly Philip Moore. If you're out there, Phil, thank you. Speaking of reunions, by the way, describe going to see the doctor who operated on you. Which one? You have to be more specific. No, no, you, you talked about going, calling up out of the blue, the guy who... who and oh, Dr. Who, Martin? Yeah. Dr. Martin. Yeah, I tracked him down. The guy who was my uh, longtime childhood surgery, the guy who did the initial closure, um, turned out to live about a mile from my brother, of all things. And I went to go visit him. And he was he was God to me. It was a very... How old was he when you went to visit him? Nine, uh, almost 90, I think. Yeah. Was, uh, he and what was that? Through, what uh, must that have been like for him to see this person who wasn't was supposed very to survive? Proud of me. He was very proud of me. He was surprised, I think. Um, but he, I was already starting to write this book, in very early stages, and there was so much I wanted to ask him. But you know, we didn't have that much time with him. My brother was with me. My brother was deeply moved by the whole thing. I mean, it's just, there's certain people in your life that they're too big in your life to know how to talk about. It's hard for me to talk about. Mark? Yes, another, another question. Um, someone asks, uh, are you able to continue to do your portraiture during the pandemic? Read my essay tomorrow in the New York Times. Um, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, I can't have anyone in my studio, which is breaking my heart. It's really hard. Uh, the essay talks about just even walking around on the street and not seeing faces anymore. You know, that's really multiply painful in a lot of ways. Um, I'm doing some work over Zoom, which is conceptually interesting. Um, it's good to feel connected. It's nothing whatever, like having somebody in my space at all. Um, there's no space, it's just flat. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no sculptural information. You can't, you can't affect anything. I mean, I can say, turn your head this way and that's about it. I can't affect lighting, I can't do, you know. <clears throat> and I'm doing some work uh, using photo photography done by photographers in a, I'm hiring photographers in other cities where I art direct a photo shoot over Zoom and then they send me the photographs. So I'm about to start a large painting of Rosemary Garland Thompson uh, that way. But it's all holding pattern and 
is to keep me from completely losing my mind. And so far as ever, yeah, it's hard. All right, thank you both. And thank you to our ASL interpreter and our live captioner. We're so glad you're here. Um, one brief thing, uh, Reva's book uh, is going to be discussed in the Chicago Reader book discussion coming up, I believe on the 16th. So go to the yeah. website to find out how to participate in that. And I believe Reva will be there with that. I will. All right, anyone whose questions didn't get answered, thank you very much uh, for the questions. And Mail me. there might be a chance that you know Reva, you can find her contact information through her rep website. I appreciate everyone being here and be well. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa. Stay healthy till we all get this uh, vaccine. Yes, Reva. I want to say libraries are one of the best things humanity ever came up with. Libraries are sacred spaces. Treat your librarian with deep reverence and deference. Don't pee in the corners. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and support it every way you can. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. No, Thank no, you for CPL. It's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much and hope to see everyone in person soon. All right. Be well.